to sort of discuss today is just an idea that I've got and an idea that sort of I've been thinking about over the last couple of years uh, in terms of being able to sort of direct trainees and give them a sense in terms of how to study effectively and how to study efficiently as well, and also en enjoy the process for this exam. And the reason why I've called it, called it Adrenaline Memories is that the aim is that I want to give you guys a framework so that it stimulates your thought processes. And the idea is that, you know, you get excited about the whole process, you know, the, the way to learn and that this release of adrenaline just helps you facilitate attention to detail and assist your brain in creating long-term memory. Because if you think about, you know, things in your life, which you remember quite clearly, it's always the things that you, you're excited about, always the things that, you know, bring a lot of joy in your life or in reverse, a lot of pain sometimes, but there are always moments in time where you're very engaged um, in that process. So one of the key things about this exam is that there's so much to learn. And as I said, the, the whole framework just aims to stimulate your thought processes and release adrenaline to facilitate attention, as well as assist you in your brain in sort of creating long-term memories. And why am I going to do it through Patreon? So one of the ways of doing it this way is that it helps keep me motivated and making sure that, you know, that this is something that is of value to you. Okay. And ultimately, um, you know, you, you, you as trainees, you're going to, you're going to be choosing it because if it's, if it's good, you'll be, you'll be, um, you'll be helping out great causes. If it's not, you'll be letting me know. And, you know, I'll be finding other ways to make sure that, uh, you know, I improve what I actually deliver in terms of uh, education. So what is my motivation? The motivation is having a positive growth mindset and helping you excel in the ANSCA primary exam. And the thing is, I also do want to support activities that are committed to positive growth. So that includes the um, charitable organizations such as the Asylum Seeker Refugee uh, Council and as well as the ANSCA Research Foundation as well, okay? Now, how are we gonna do this? So we're gonna break down SAQs uh, during these sessions. And the way that we're going to do that is through a very structured approach. So this is like um, having, so we've got the ingredients and these are like the steps in terms of what I do to create an answer for, for, the, um, for, a, for an example, for a SAQ, a model answer for an SAQ. So the first thing that I do is I review the examiner's report. And then after that, I do a literature review of the textbooks that are recommended by the college. And if there's anything that's um, sort of conflicting, I, I will search through um, research articles as well. Okay, so if you know, whenever I come across that, um, I will include that in in the um, uh, in the attachments for you guys to have a look at as well. And then after that, we're going to create an answer structure, and then after that, we're going to write an answer to time. All right. And when I say write an answer to time. It's remember it's a ten minute SAQ, so we want to be able to create an we want to create a really good answer in less than ten minutes. Now, for this first episode, we're going to go through the August September two thousand and sixteen question one, which is describe the respiratory effects of adding positive N expiratory pressure or PEEP to intermittent positive pressure ventilation or IPPV. Now, going through the examiner's report, so. This question was repeated from the last exam where the pass rate was 1%. Candidates that had read and studied the examination report showed a more detailed understanding of the relevant points and scored better. Now, what I've done now is I've, I've highlighted um, statements in green, which I think are important to um, sort of have in your answer. And then there's also statements which I highlighted in red, which is things that we should avoid in our answer. All right. So the next statement is a pass could be achieved by acknowledging that anesthesia causes a reduction in the FRC, that PEEP is applied to mitigate this effect by outlining the effects on compliance and airways resistance that occurs, and by showing and understanding that this improves FRC in relation to closing capacity, thereby recruiting dependent airways improving VQ matching, and hence oxygenation. So the, the key thing is that we, we want to be able to structure all these 
um, key words which the examiner has pointed out in the exams report in our final answer. And that's that should be our goal uh, at the end of today. All right. Now, unfortunately, many of these marks were missed by candidates who spend time on definitions of PEEP, IPPV, and describing the models, pressure and volume for ventilation that can be used, which no marks were awarded for. So this already tells us that we're not, we're not going to be requiring to define what PEEP is or IPPV, or other than just drawing the pressure volume loops of um, lung compliance, we probably don't need to actually describe the different, the different types of modes um, that ventilation that IPP uses. So what they mean is the um, whether you're using pressure controlled ventilation or volume controlled ventilation. All right. Now answers that included comments on the adverse effects of PEEP generally scored better. Many candidates correctly drew the pulmonary compliance curve and accurately described the increase in compliance right shift that occurs with the application of PEEP. However, few went on to describe the reduction in compliance that occurs with over PEEP and the damage that this uh, may cause. Few answers had the x-axis the of the compliance curve correctly labeled with the positive pressure numbers reflecting a lack of integration of book knowledge into the answer. All right, so this is important in terms of when we do draw the compliance curve, we need to make sure that we label the the axes as well as they also want they look like they want to they want us to provide numbers and and often you'll see the numbers and we'll go through often the numbers that you'll see are often um might be negative to reflect spontaneous ventilation but in this case they're talking about positive pressure ventilation so we need to make sure that the pressures we draw will have positive numbers okay now the exams report goes on to say a reduction in work of breathing due to improved compliance and reduced airways resistance does occur with optimal FRC. However, in a mechanically ventilated patient, this is manifested by a reduction in ventilator pressures and effort by the machine rather than energy expenditure from the patient. Again, very good point, um, sort of describing that, that when a patient is mechanically ventilated, they're actually not um, expanding any effort or any energy in doing that work. Okay. The machine is doing all the work. And when we sort of talk about the reduction in ventilator pressures, we can often refer to that as either dynamic compliance or static compliance. In other words, if you have increased um, dynamic compliance, you should see that you should get a reduction in your ventilator pressures for a given volume. Okay. And then same with if you have an improvement in your static compliance, you should be able to see a reduction in the pressure for a given change in volume. Now, what I'll do is I'll, I'll show you the diagrams and we'll actually explain all these sort of concepts and hopefully that it will all sort of come together. Now, what I've highlighted in red is that PEEP does not prolong apnea time at anesthesia induction, RSI, by providing an increased oxygen reservoir because it has not been applied until after intubation and commencement of ventilation. Um, it's a little bit of a nuanced thing um, because what he's talking about is that, yes, you don't actually apply PEEP. You actually apply CPAP uh, for someone uh, prior to um, intubation if you want to do, uh, if you want to increase the oxygen reserves, all right? So candidates who correctly acknowledge that PEEP provides benefit at extubation and its use is associated with less atelect trauma, shear stress, and inflammatory response scored extra marks. So this little bit here is the bit where I talk about, um, so you've got statements which are going to give you a pass, statements which are, which are going to give you a good pass, and statements which are going to give you um, the extra marks, which will head you up to a four or five out of five, okay? Now, cardiovascular effects of PEEP only gain marks when describing VQ changes that may occur and the effect of PEEP and PaO2. Now, they've, they've, I think they've purposely been vague on this because what they're talking about is the idea of how PEEP affects um, alveolar dead space. All right, and we'll, we'll sort of discuss with that um, when we're looking through our literature review. So what I do next is I summarize the exam's report. So after reading all that, 
what I think is that what will constitute a pass is that we need to state that PEEP minimizes the reduction in FRC caused by anesthesia. And then after that, we need to talk about the benefits of FRC above closing capacity on compliance and resistance, recruitment of dependent airways, improved VQ matching and oxygenation. In other words, after you make a statement about how um, PEEP is beneficial in maintaining FRC during anesthesia, this question is actually talking about the benefits of FRC, okay? And, and in fact, this question can be modeled another way in terms of what are the benefits of, SR, of maintaining FRC during anesthesia. So that, that's another way sort of to ask this question as well. Now, what would constitute a good pass if we, is if we start talking about the adverse effects of over -peep? And then what will give you extra marks would be adding in the benefits of PEEP at extubation and in reducing shear stress, the inflammatory response and atelectrauma. electroma, all right? So we've got all those things that um, we need to try to add to our final answer. And we need to sort of do all that in um, within sort of 10 minutes. Now, the next thing I do is I do a literature review. So the way I do a literature review is um, I've got a couple of keywords already. So the keywords that I use to search through um, the sort of the, the prescribed text is going to be PEEP and FRC. Just keep it simple. And then what I do is, you know, from those texts, um, which I provided for you already, I've, I'll, what I was, I'll just summarize the important points. And then from there, yeah, we can start creating an answer. Okay. So the textbooks that I've used, and you can use um, whatever textbooks that uh, you would like, but these two are the ones I think that are really good in terms of where you should sort of focus on in terms of where the answer is, okay? So I've looked in, I've looked in the other, other textbooks like Miller's, um, Stolting, uh, Hemmings. I, I think just in terms of clarity, I think Power and Cam and, and Nun and Lama are really good. And then you can probably add a little bit from, from West as well. although. West doesn't really talk too much about PEEP and what, what's beneficial about West is that it, it probably lends itself more in terms of um, looking at the benefits of FRC, but you can certainly get it from these two textbooks here. Now, this is a summary of Power and Cam, chapter 22, and I've highlighted the important um, points in the paragraph, which I think uh, are relevant to this question. So the relevant statements are that PEEP maintains FRC above closing capacity during anesthesia. And remember that closing capacity is the volume where once you reach that, you start getting um, pulmonary alveolar collapse, okay? And then after that, you get atelectasis, and then after that, you get shunt. So the idea is that um, by having peak there, you actually maintain your FRC rather than reduce your FRC during anesthesia. Now, the other things which Power and Cam talk about is that PEEP also increases your alveolar dead space, all right? So this, is, this occurs with high PEEP. So in other words, if you start using very high levels of PEEP, often it's quoted, I think, uh, mainly sort of above uh, 10 to 12 centimeters of water, all right? And then uh, the other thing that increases alveolar dead space is decreased pulmonary arterial pressures. So that could be a gravitational effect where it affects non-dependent zones more than dependent zones. So remember that when they talk about non-dependent zones, they're talking about the top of the lung and dependent zones, they're talking about the bottom of the lung. And if you're in the lateral position, it's the same as well. Your non-dependent lung is the top one and your dependent lung is your bottom lung. Now, the other things that affect um, decreased pulmonary arterial pressure is also hypovolemia as well. Now, the other thing that you should also know is that it's, it's all sort of correlated in terms of um, when you use high peak, it does increase your pulmonary vascular resistance. And Power and Cam doesn't talk about this, but NUN certainly does, all right? So I just want you to have that in mind because when, when you see what NUN um, NUN adds into it, we, we're gonna have to sort of combine the two, the two texts uh, and the two sort of uh, concepts together, all right? Now, this is a summary of Power and Camp chapter 16. And this is quite nice. These are, this basically describes the functions of FRC. So the four, these are really the four, these are the four key things. It's an oxygen storage, 
it prevents airway collapse and atelectasis. So it reduces shunt and, um, and a part of that is also improving your VQ matching as well. It minimizes your pulmonary vascular resistance and it minimizes work of breathing. And the way that it minimizes work of breathing is through minimizing airways resistance and maximizing lung compliance. So just sort of, we'll pause on that and we'll have a think about this, okay? So this is a really important slide because this will sort of form the, the core of our answer here. So the functions of FRC, it's oxygen storage, prevents airway collapse, atelectasis, minimizes pulmonary vascular resistance and minimizes work of breathing. And the, and the way that it minimizes work of breathing is through minimizing airways resistance and maximizing lung compliance. Now, this is a summary of um, NUNS chapter 32. And the important points are that PEEP increases lung volume and re-expands collapsed alveoli in dependent areas of the lung. So what it's saying is that with anesthesia, you get um, a reduction in FRC below your closing capacity, and that causes uh, pulmonary alveoli collapse. And what PEEP can do is that it can re-recruit, okay, um, these, um, these collapse area of the lung. Now, this is what I sort of also mentioned as well with um, over PEEP. So PEEP more than 10 to 15 centimeters of water can lead to alveolar dead space. And the way it does this is through increased pulmonary vascular resistance, and it also decreases cardiac output as well. So remember that in the slide before, we had, um, this is Power and Camp talking about how PEEP increases alveolar dead space. It increases alveolar dead space through a decreased pulmonary arterial pressure, through a gravity effect, and also through hypovolemia, whereas NUNS sort of builds on that concept, which talks about that PEEP increases your pulmonary vascular resistance and decreases your cardiac output, all right? And I believe there should be a diagram to show this. So this is the figure 6.4, which NUNS um, points to. And I think it's one to sort of read it, okay? So this is figure 6.4 is the relationship between pulmonary vascular resistance and lung volume. The solid red line represents total pulmonary vascular resistance and is minimal at functional residual capacity. So that's at the, this point here. Okay, so if I just sort of annotate this, this point here is your FRC. Okay, and this is where pulmonary vascular resistance is at its lowest. So what contributes to pulmonary vascular resistance? Well, you've got compression of alveolar capillaries, which is your dash blue line, is responsible for the increased pulmonary vascular resistance as lung volume approaches total lung capacity. So as you can see, as your lung volume increases, your pulmonary vascular resistance due to stretching, or sorry, due to compression of the alveolar capillaries increases. And therefore what happens is that this increases your pulmonary vascular resistance. Now, Increasing pulmonary vascular resistance as lung volume approaches residual volume may result from compression of corner capillaries or extra alveolar vessels or from hypoxic induced vasoconstriction in collapsed lung units. Now, this is quite interesting because, so what it's saying is that as, as, your, as your lung volume, oh, sorry, hold on two seconds while I admit someone in. So what it's saying is that as your lung volume decreases towards residual volume, there are actually two, two or three possible causes of an increase in pulmonary vascular resistance. And that's from compression of the corner capillaries or extra alveolar vessels, okay? Or from hypoxia-induced phase of constriction in, um, in the collapsed lung units. Now, you'll also see this graph in West, so West will have a, a similar graph and West attributes it to either compression of extra alveolar vessels when it's at residual volume and it will say stretching of capillaries at total lung capacity. So similar sort of concepts again, um, but nuns, this, this, this graph of nuns just expands on that a little bit more. The other thing that you'll note in this nuns diagram is that it doesn't have any units. All right. So um, 
the one in West does and the ones in West. So this is in mills and, and primary vascular resistance. The one that you'll see in West is, um, sorry, centimeters of H2O per liter per second. And correct me if I'm wrong, I'm just doing this from memory. I believe that the, that the units that they have are uh, 60 to 120 and the lung volume was 50 to 200 all right and if anyone has if anyone has that on them feel feel free to correct me if, if that is incorrect all right but that's the that's the numbers that you'll get uh, from west okay so we continue on with the summary of uh, NUNS, chapter 32. And we know that PEEP will restore your functional residual capacity. And the way it does this is that it raises it above closing capacity. Now, you can, you can see already from the summary of the chapters that one of the key things that we need to add to this to our answer is the idea that PEEP is going to be maintaining FRC above closing capacity because that has been repeated multiple times in the exams report in power and cam and now in nuns. So, so we know that this, that this is a very, very key concept, okay? Um, the other thing is that it reduces airways resistance and it incre increases compliance of dependent airways. And this is, these two, these two concepts here is what we, um, what sort of uh, power and cam sort of, uh, um, sort of includes in terms of decreasing the work of breathing, okay? so having a reduction in your airways resistance and an increase in compliance of dependent airways will decrease um, work of breathing, okay? All right, so now um, we've got figure um, 2.7, which is uh, another sort of uh, diagram that uh, Nan sort of talks about. So this diagram here, this one's a little bit complex and um, I think just good to just to acknowledge this graph, I, I probably wouldn't, um, I probably wouldn't draw this graph in my answer, okay? But this is a static pressure volume relations for the intact thorax for the conscious subject in the upright position and the transmural pressure gradient bears the same relationship to lung volume during both intermittent positive pressure ventilation and spontaneous breathing. Do, the intrathoracic to ambient pressure difference, however, differs in the two types of ventilation because of muscle action during spontaneous respiration. At all times, alveolar ambient pressure difference equals alveolar intrathoracic pressure difference plus intrathoracic amb ambient pressure difference due to due attention being paid to the sign of the pressure difference. Isn't that a very, very confusing uh, description of that figure? All right, so essentially all it's saying is that this green line here, which is your alveolar minus intrathoracic pressure describes just your lung compliance, all right? And this blue line here describes your chest wall compliance. And when it, when it talks about um, the alveolar sort of ambient pressure difference, which is the alveolar ambient, that's, that's the total respiratory lung compliance. And the total respiratory lung compliance is essentially the addition of your chest wall and lung compliance. That's, that's essentially what this whole uh, description is talking about. So the, so the red line here is your total respiratory lung compliance. This green line here is solely just your lung compliance. And this one here is your chest wall compliance, okay? And you can see at FRC, so at this point here, at FRC, you have equilibrium. So it's, so it's it's an equilibrium point of both where the your lung compliance and your chest wall compliance are at status quo. So this is this is all in equilibrium. Okay. Now this is a figure 3.5, which describes the um, how airways resistance changes with. Uh, increasing lung volume. And what it says is airways resistance and conductance as a function of lung volume, upright posture, the resistance curve is a hyperbola, specific conductance is the gradient of the conductance line. 
So what it's saying is that if once you have alveolar collapse, or sorry, once you have once you have um, alveolar collapse and you sort of reach towards residual volume, you can see that your that your airways resistance starts increasing significantly. Okay, and then the benefit of PEEP is that it shifts your lung volume to the right hand side, and the idea is that we we want that heading towards this point here, okay, where airways resistance is minimal. And as you can see, as you increase PEEP, your airways resistance drops, but the marginal gain reduces. And then the downside of this is that even though you're, you're reducing airways resistance, you, you are increasing alveolar dead space because you're increasing your pulmonary vascular resistance. So I'll just show you. So in this, in this slide here, it shows that airways resistance is decreasing. And we just go look at the previous slide, which is this one here. As lung volume increases, your pulmonary vascular resistance um, starts to increase. So there's always, so there's that, there's that in, interplay between sort of those two forces, all right? Now, this is figure 32.8 from Nuns. And I would, this is, this is the one diagram, if I, if, I, if I was to have in my answer, that I would, I would reproduce for this exam. Okay, I mean, for this question. So figure 32.8 is the effect of positive and expiratory pressure on the relationship between regional pressure and volume in the lung in the supine position. Note that compliance is greater in the upper part of the lung with zero and expiratory pressure and in the lower part of the lung with PEEP, which thus improves ventilation in the dependent zone. So in other words, what it's saying is that with anesthesia, it shifts your curve down so that now your bases are functioning on the lower part of the compliance curve, okay? And what, F, and what PEEP does is that it moves you back up this gradient here so that now, you're, now that your bases during anesthesia is now functioning on the steep part of the compliance curve. All right, and this is what the examiner was alluding to in terms of understanding that um, with the use of PEEP, it would right shift your lung compliance. All right, in other words, anesthesia causes a left shift in terms of your lung compliance so that your bases are now functioning on the non-compliant part versus your um, apices or non-dependent. And then with the addition of PEEP, you start, you, you're gonna be moving up that curve. So this is, this is the one diagram that I would, absolutely have in my answer. Now, the thing about this diagram to note is that they've only got change in pressure and change in volume. They actually don't have any numbers at all, all right? So we need to have a think about what numbers we're gonna put in. And I think, you know, knowing if you, if you sort of um, look at sort of other textbooks, I think what is pretty safe to say is that if you go from zero in terms of pressure to let's say about 50, and in the middle somewhere, you've got the range of um, five to ten. All right. In other words, if you've got if you've got no peep at all, this is this is what happens to your um, lung compliance. And then if you add the addition of peep, this is how it sort of moves up this curve here. Sorry, Stan. Yes. Are you trying to annotate because it's not coming up on my screen? If you oh, are. it's not. Right. I'm, I do apologize. Um, it, can you see the slide though? I can see the slide. Yep. Oh, right. So can, can anyone else see the annotations? I also no, can't see the annotations. I can't see Dan. Oh, apologies. Oh, that, cause I, I, I went and uh, downloaded this program called ink to go and I'm, <laughs> I'm glad you guys could, uh, I'm, I'm glad you've sort of pointed that out. So hopefully maybe in the recording, maybe it will come through as an, uh, the annotations. But um, what I'll do is um, at the end, when I, when I write the answer, um, I, will, I, will, um, I will sort of describe what I am describing here on the graphs here. But can you see my pointer? Yes. Yes? Okay. All right. So you can, you can see. Okay. So um, what I'll do is uh, I will have this graph in my final answer, okay, with, with what, with what um, annotations I have at the moment. All right. For sure. Thank you. No worries at all. Okay, so now um, 
just continuing on with the summary of nuns chapter 32. So this is where I think um, uh, this is where you get sort of the extra marks from or the extra understanding of, of how PEEP uh, affects um, the respiratory system. So PEEP minimally improves oxygen delivery in healthy patients. So this is a, this is a very important statement, all right? Because it's almost counterintuitive to what we think. So what happens is that it decreases shunt, but this is negated by a reduction in your cardiac output, which then reduces your oxygen delivery and mixed venous oxygen saturations. And I'll, and I'll sort of expand on that sort of concept in the next slide. Um, and the other thing is that with PEEP, even though it decreases shunt, it increases your alveolar dead space or your West Zone 1. So um, when is it of benefit? So PEEP has maximal benefit only when pathology is present. So the pathologies that Nuns talks about is pulmonary edema and an acute lung injury or ARDS. And I've written and I've put the references in, in terms of where you can find further information on it, um, page 343 and 370. But again, I've just summarized what I think are the other important concepts here on how on how PEEP um, has benefit with pulmonary edema. And that's through extravascular water redu redistribution. And it also reduces your right ventricular and diastolic volume in a failing heart improving your right ventricle and left ventricular function. And then the way it does it for acute lung injury or ARDS is that PEEP decreases shunt and improves arterial PO2 and ARDS. However, once you start increasing PEEP, so at about 15 centimeters of water of PEEP, it reduces your cardiac output by 20%, resulting in no significant change in oxygen delivery. So remember that when we talk about oxygen delivery, it's a function not only of the partial pressure of oxygen in blood, but also of your cardiac output as well, all right? So if you think about the oxygen um, delivery equation, it's your cardiac output multiplied by the oxygen content in blood, which is both a function of the uh, partial pressure of oxygen as well as your hemoglobin as well as your saturations. So this is a graph um, that you'll see from nuns. And again, don't need to, I, I, I probably wouldn't um, have this sort of to replicate for the exam, um, but I think it is important just to know so that it helps you understand what I just described. Now, uh, this line here just shows you what happens with increasing PEEP. So with increasing PEEP, you get, you get an increase in your lung volume. And when you get an increase in your lung volume, this, the, this blue line here is your non-inflated tissue. So it's, your, it's the amount of tissue that's collapsed. You can see that starts decreasing, all right? And that makes sense. So PEEP, as you increase PEEP, increases your lung volume, decreases the amount of non-collapsed airways. And what you can also see is that, is that as you decrease the amount of collapsed airways, your shunt fraction reduces. And naturally you sort of think, okay, fantastic. So I'm reducing my shunt fraction. I should be improving my oxygenation. But what you'll see is that oxygen delivery plateaus. So you can see it, it, even, it even reduces. And this is despite an increase in the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood. Now, the reason for that is that previous concept where increasing PEEP decreases your cardiac output. So you can see your cardiac output decreases uh, significantly, all right? And ultimately what that leads to is just a plateauing of your oxygen delivery. So this is, um, so figure 31.3 is the effect of positive and expiratory pressure on various factors influencing oxygen delivery in patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome. So although arterial PO2 is increased, cardiac output is decreased and there is no significant change in oxygen transport. So just, so just be aware, and this is also clinically as well, is that yes, PEEP is good, um, but excessive PEEP is actually um, non-beneficial, all right? Now, this is another table from 
nouns. And this table here has just some numbers here. So let me just pop this to the side here. Um, and what it shows is that as you, so you've got IPPV and you've got IPPV plus P. And those are probably the two things I just want you to start, guys to sort of focus on. So you've got an FI2 of 0.4 for, for both. And what you have is you have a decrease of your shunt fraction as you add P. Okay, so QS, QT is your shunt fraction. And you can see that's almost halved. Now, the other thing that you should note is that when you add PEEP, you increase your alveolar dead space, which is represented for, by VDVT, all right? In fact, that's actually your physiological dead space, VDVT, all right? And you can see that that goes from 38 to 44. Now, the other thing that you see is your, your, your cardiac output decreases from 4.5 to 3.7. So even though you've got a rise in your partial pressure of oxygen from 141 to 153, because you have got a reduction in your cardiac output and you also have an increase in your physiological dead space, you'll see that the net effect on oxygen delivery is minimal. All right. So um, the last sort of bit with um, nuns is that optimal PEEP occurs at the lower inflection of the static compliance curve where the change in volume is greatest for a given change in pressure. What does that mean? So what it's saying is that this is a, this is a normal lung, and this is a lung with um, acute lung injury. And what it's talking about is that at this lower inflection point, if, you're, if this is where your lung compliance is currently functioning on, what you want to do is you want to apply PEEP so that you move it up here so that now it's functioning on the steep part of the curve. In other words, if you read this bit here, application of a positive and expiratory pressure of approximately 12 centimeters of water in this patient will therefore improve tidal volume relative to the ventilatory pressure required, all right? And what you don't wanna do is you don't wanna provide too much peak so that the pressures are up this point here and then they're functioning on, again, on the, on the lower part of the compliance curve. So point B indicates the upper inflection point above which alveolar dis over distension may occur. Therefore, in this patient, airway pressure should be ideally maintained below 35 centimeters of water. And that's, and that's what um, you can do so when you've got someone on the ventilator. You can, you can change their PEEP until for a given change in volume, you've got the greatest change. So for a given change in pressure, you've got the, give, you've got the, um, you've got the greatest change in volume. Okay, and that's when you know they're functioning on, on the steep part of the compliance curve. And you can do that in theater. So if, if you've got someone who's currently being ventilated, um, so let's say with uh, pressure control ventilation, what you'd have is you'd slowly increase the PEEP. And for a given inspired um, pressure, what you want to see is that you want to see the volume increase to know that you know, they're functioning on the steep part of the compliance curve. Now, if you have someone on volume control ventilation, what you will see is that as you increase the PEEP and they're on the steep part of the compliance curve, your, your pressures will start, your peak pressures will drop, okay? So in other words, the compliance improves and the, the way that a compliance improves with someone who's mechanically ventilated is that for a given change in pressure, there is a greater change in volume. All right, so this is the, this should be the last bit from nuns. Um, and that's a summary of chapter 32. And that this one describes uh, the effect of PEEP on ventilator induced lung injury. So this was the last, um, last bit that the examiner's report was um, sort of talking about. So uh, PEEP prevents adolect trauma and cyclical airway closure and reopening. It limits inflammation to the epithelium and reduces interstitial edema, which also helps preserve surfactant function. And that's the mechanism. And then the adverse effects of PEEP, you get barrel trauma from sustained levels of over PEEP. Okay. Now, most patients will develop small areas of atelectasis during anesthesia, and the mechanisms are airway closure from reduction of FRC below closing capacity, and that's probably the most common cause. Um, the other ways are that you can get compression atelectasis, absorption atelectasis. And the way that we prevent atelectasis is that we can use CPAP on induction and PEEP after induction. And this is what the examiner's comment was sort of mentioning in terms of um, that we don't 
the, you know, we don't really use PEEP on, um, on induction. We tend to use CPAP, all right? So PEEP prior to extubation. Now, now this is, uh, this is probably a um, little bit different to what the examiner was saying. So P prior to extubation does not prevent impaired oxygenation in PACU. Now, just to sort of um, rehash what the examiner wrote, he did credit that if you were to write um, using the use of PEEP, the beneficial use of PEEP at extubation um, was a positive, but in nuns, it's, it's saying that uh, the use of PEEP prior to extubation does not prevent impaired oxygenation in PACU. So, you know, when, when that happens, the way that I sort of think about this is, all right, so it's probably, it's probably just a time thing. So you could make the argument that the use of PEEP is beneficial in the immediate extubation phase. It, it probably doesn't change much. In fact, there's, I've got research articles which show that um, it doesn't actually change uh, in terms of what happens in PACU, because once once someone is extubated, you lose that PEEP. So um, once you lose that PEEP, it tends to, you know, you tend, if if the patient is still asleep, they may develop alveolar collapse. And the way to improve that is to re-recruit them um, in recovery. But the, but the use of PEEP doesn't actually prevent that from happening. All right. All right. So here we go. So this is how I would create a general structure so after, after we've done our, my, my literature review, what I'm going to do now is we're going to create a general structure and after that, we're going to write an answer. So my general structure will include an introductory statement where I'm going to describe the relationship between anesthesia, FRC, and PEEP. And then after that, we're going to talk about the benefits of PEEP or the benefits of FRC and the adverse effects of PEEP. So just to sort of summarize, um, when we talk about the benefits of PEEP and the benefits of FRC, there were four things. There were four things um, in, in Power and Camp. So there was an oxygen store. And then after that, it decreased, um, decreased your work of breathing. It decreased uh, atelectasis or pulmonary collapse. So in other words, it improves VQ matching and decreases your shunt. And the other thing is that it decreases your pulmonary vascular resistance. Now, we also need to mention that when we sort of um, look through nuns as well, we also, we also have to talk about how it decreases ventilator-induced lung injury. And then the adverse effects of PEEP, the, the two things that uh, are, I want to include are barrel trauma from over PEEP and also the idea of um, alveolar dead space as well. All right. So, good. All right. Let's see. Let's see if this works. You guys, you guys should join in too. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get my, and I'm going to use my phone, but you can't, you can't use your phone on the day. So make sure that um, you do use something that's, that's probably a little bit more legal. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to, I'm going to time myself 10 minutes and we're going to write the answer to that question. Okay. So um, now I have left a PDF um sample of what the exam paper looks like and what I do is I print it off just a couple of exam papers and then what I do is I write my exam paper I write my my template exam answer on this on this paper here okay so if you guys have one uh, start using it and then what I'll do is um, I'll write it here okay so let's get started all right all right so first I'm going to say is that Pete is an apologies i'm actually left-handed so you'll, you'll only see the um what i've written after i release my left hand okay so peep is added to ippv during and notice how i haven't expanded on peep and ippv because it because they had those um acronyms with the with the question okay during general anesthesia and i will i will do an acronym for general anesthesia to one, um, two. So one is the main thing, which is to maintain FRC above closing capacity. Okay. Um, and then the second thing, which is why, which is why PEEP is important, is that it prevents or 
reverses atelectasis. Now, we're going to split this into the beneficial effects beneficial effects of PEEP, so the beneficial respiratory effects and the adverse effects, all right? So the beneficial effects include. Um, and then what I, what I know is that there's, so there's four things from, uh, from Power and Chem, and then there's one thing I need to include from, uh, from none. So the four things, are, and you can do it in any order, but um, I'll do it as decrease work of breathing. And what I'll do is I'll probably skip a page and come back to that. And then after that, I'll say maintains FRC annual oxygen store. Third thing is that it improves VQ matching and decreases your shunt. QS or QT by preventing or reversing atelectasis. And then um, probably the fourth thing we said was that it reduces pulmonary vascular resistance. And then what I'll do is, oh, in fact, I probably don't need to write much for this actually. So I'll just say it also reduces ventilator um, induced lung injury. And then after that one here, I'll have the adverse effects of P, which are barrel trauma and what we also have is um, increase in alveolar dead space and a decrease in cardiac output and subsequently oxygen delivery. So that's, um, so that's how I would structure my answer with that. And then after that, what I would do is I would go back and fill it in. So decrease work of breathing. Um, so this is evidence by a, by an increase in static compliance during IPPV. And what I would draw is curve here. So this is the curve I was talking about. So you'd have your pressure, volume in mils. This is in centimeters of water. So 0, 5, 10, 15. And I would have a curve that looks like this. And then what I would say is that this point here is with GA with IPPV plus no PEEP. And that with PEEP, which shifts it up to here. So this is one, this is two. So this is GA with IPPV plus PEEP. Okay. So this shows that you've got an increase in your static compliance during IPPV. And then after that, you also have an increase in dynamic compliance by decreasing your airways resistance through a increasing radial traction of bronchi. And this is evidence, and this is um, evidenced by decrease in your peak alveolar pressures. All right. Now, with the maintenance of FRC and oxygen store, uh, again, with, we're just going to say that it's beneficial 
in the immediate extubation phase. And with the <clears throat> improving VQ matching and decrease in shunt, um, the main thing is that it maintains, the way that it prevents um, atelectasis is that it maintains FRC above closing capacity. And then the way that it reverses atelectasis is that it recruits, um, it recruits collapsed alveoli in the dependent lung. Now, the way that it um, reduces pulmonary vascular resistance is that um, what it does is it limits compression of extra alveolar vessels. And you can also put corner capillaries as well, but I've just chosen extra alveolar vessels. And it also limits hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction from collapse lung units. Um, and with the reduction in your ventilator induced lung injury, we're going to say prevention of cyclical airway closure and reopening and limits inflammation to epithelium and reduces interstitial edema and preserves surfactant. Now I'm just looking at the time and I've got I've done it in eight minutes. I've got two minutes left. So I've, I've got to, I've got to crack on. So um, I've got barrel trauma with um, excessive peep. And with this, I want to say net effect of peep in healthy individuals results in only a small improvement in oxygen delivery and patients with pathology. And the ones we talked about are APO, acute lung injury or ARDS. benefit most from peak. All right. That's nine minutes and 30 seconds. Oh, that was exhausting. But um, that's my, this would be my, this would be my 10 minute answer. For this uh, for this question, and and look, I guess you could you could do it um, differently. And I guess if I had more time, uh, another thing that I would draw would probably be a graph with the um, that that shows how pulmonary vascular resistance um, changes with uh, total lung volume. But I'm, I'm going to be true to my time because, um, you know, this took me nine minutes and thirty seconds, and and in on the day of the exam, um, this would this would be my complete answer, and I would close it off, and I would move on to the to my next answer. All right. <laughs>